Welcome to the Woodlands, Texas. This is our applications lab here in uh, Woodlands, Texas. This is just north of Houston. Uh, we do everything x-ray here, uh, but what Ton and I specialize in is the uh, XRF. So I'm Glenn Williams. And I'm Ton Lin. And uh, we're going to be talking today about XRF in formulations. So how we can you know, easily use uh, XRF uh, to support development of formulation activities. So we've talked through uh, this in a number of sessions. We have another one uh, later, uh, and then we have a workshop uh, at uh, 2.30. Hope you can uh, join us for that. We're gonna get into more details. Um, but we're covering a lot of these, these topics, um, including looking at uh, XRF to uh, investigate catalyst residues. So this would be you know, used in your process chemistry groups, um, looking at catalyst poison. So Catalysts that aren't performing well, are there elements in there that are uh, inhibiting the, uh, the performance, as well as in salt formation. So, and that, that's something that could kind of, depending on where you are in the formulation process, if you're in early formulations and you do things on a form, uh, whether it be salt or polymorphs, uh, you might benefit from uh, this, but this is a separate session here. We're looking at carbon, nitrogen, oxygen analysis for stoichiometry. Uh, and then, of course, uh, excipient blending and forming. That's one of the things that we're going to focus on in this session here. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's a, a variety of different uh, applications. The ones that we're going to kind of uh, focus on here are blend uniformity, as well as contamination analyses using mapping. So there's some features to a couple of our instruments that will really help support that. And, and in mapping in the sense of microanalysis. Yeah, exactly. So not necessarily looking like you would under an SEM, um, but but in basically in support of uh, finding little specks and things like that. You don't have to map the whole area, just find out what that little speck is. Okay, so just to give a little background on uh, x-ray fluorescence, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. In fact, if you join us again at 2.30 Central Time uh, for our workshop, we're going to go spend maybe about half an hour talking about um, that we have a whole 90 minute session, but we're going to devote a little bit more time so you can really understand what's going on with uh, fluorescence and you know why it's a benefit. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background, what we're using is the x-ray tube. So we're using x-rays, a uh, spectrum of x-rays uh, to excite the sample and produce fluorescent x-rays from the sample. Uh, what happens is that you have a uh, primary x-rays incident on the material, if they're of sufficient energy, they will kick out inner shell electrons, which will be lost as photoelectrons. This will leave an unstable state. And so then what will happen are the less stable outer shell electrons will fall to fill that void, and they will fill that at a more stable state. And the difference in energy between this outer state and the uh, inner shell electron will be lost as a or us an x-ray. And this is what we're going to be, you know, analyzing with the machine. Now, there are a lot of extra instruments that Rogaku has. However, we can't fill it all in this entire page, but we're going to um, narrow it down specifically for this type of application so you can understand it better. So currently, we have all these instruments um, ranging from the floor model down to our bench top that can be used in pharma. In particular, the Primus 4 and the Primus 4i, which is the tube above and tube below configuration. Which we're right behind right. Primus 4 right, right here. That's that machine you see on the left. And then similarly, we have our 3 kilowatt system that is very similar configuration to the Primus 4, but it um, doesn't have the like uh, the mapping features. And it's just uh, vacuum only. Then we have our benchtop systems. That is the Super Mini 200. That's a WD wavelength dispersive, and we have our energy dispersive um, next DE. So basically, we can use the entire range of all these instruments for this application. So certain formulations, you know, really that wide range of right. machines we can use. Um, we actually covered a session on ICHQ3D. So looking at heavy metals in in the formulations. Um, and uh, that was at, at 9.15, but all of these sessions are gonna be on, on the system, I think for a full month, uh, and then on our website. So if you get a chance, um, go back and you know look at those, those sessions and those videos 
um, because we go into you know specific uh, ones. In fact, you know uh, at, at 10:15 there was the uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen analysis. Um, so you might find that, but I'm not going to go into this. But of course, this is something that could be used for formulator as well. Um, so we're going to focus on right now is uh, API, so blend uniformity, checking the potency of the uh, API in the final products. So a really good example that we're using for this is uh, level thyroxin, um, which is a uh, basically a thyroid treatment medicine um, that's taken by over 13 million people in the United States. Um, it's for a variety of different thyroid related um, indications. Uh, this is the structure over here, it's a sodium salt, uh, but more importantly, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, is it, it has uh, four iodines in the structure. Um, it's got a very narrow ther therapeutic index, meaning that if you were to take you know, a certain amount, um, let's say you were to take 50 mil micrograms of this uh, medicine, um, you get no effect and no beneficial effect for whatever ailments uh, it's supposed to treat. Uh, if you were to take, let's say, 70 micrograms, you'll get a benefit. But if you were to take, let's say, something like just a little bit more, like 90 micrograms, you might actually get an adverse effect. And those adverse effects, you know, are listed here that are common in this, this medicine. Um, but the important thing here is there are some medicines, you can take a whole bunch of it, even more than what the, uh, the actual therapeutic dose is, um, and have no adverse effect. This one gives an uh, adverse effect at just a small increase. Um, and below the therapeutic dose, you can get no effect. So they really have to be dosing yeah. it out. So that's why you, you have to have a good quality control on these limits so that you're not going to have all these adverse effects, whether you're below or above the therapeutic window for this right. medicine. Hey, why am I so small? Oh, there we are. <laughs> okay. Um, just look through the magnifying glass and you'll see us. <laughs> Um, so the, the point we're trying to make on this slide here in a, in a pretty bad way is that um, this is a very low dose, um, but also a very low drug loading um, material. So what that means is that, you know, if you were to compare it and for, for comparison, we're showing here aspirin, a low dose aspirin, which is only 81 milligrams, the total pill weight is 110 milligrams. So it's a very small, and if anybody's taken like a low dose aspirin, it's a small pill. Um, the level thyroxin tablets, and they range from you know anywhere maybe about 50 micrograms uh, dose up to like maybe 150 micrograms, depending on the dose. Um, the actual tablet weighting is very small as well. So if you were to look in comparison to the aspirin, this is a, about a 950 times less concentrated than what the aspirin pill is. And you know that's already very small aspirin pill. So in other words, there's very small amount of level thyroxin in that pill. And the do dose loading you know, is only 100 micrograms, but it's also got a lot of other stuff in there. So getting that 100 micrograms in each pill is a challenge. Um, and this is evidenced by the fact that there's been a lot of recalls on this, on this product. Uh, and the fact you couple that in with a very narrow therapeutic index and you know you you have situations where um, there's there's been recalls because it's just over a, a little bit um, and so when I my understanding is that there will be you know customers will take just a certain brand and if they're switched by their provider to another brand who maybe theirs runs a little bit high they've now changed what their normal dose is um, so this is just an article a recent article and this is you know, in May of 2021, this month, yeah, this month, um, where they've had to recall uh, a lot of batches uh, because 43 people had serious problems, not just a recall due to uh, knowing that there's a, a different potency in that, but also there were actually adverse effects. Um, and the same company had previously recalled um, for uh, super potency as well as sub potency a year ago. So it is a known, you know, issue, and uh, you know, testing or finding different ways or easier ways to test it in the manufacturing um, would be beneficial. So what we're doing here is illustrating how XRF could be used for that. Um, this is very fortunate and really a, a perfect candidate for XRF um, because. There are four iodines, as we mentioned before, in the molecule, which are really 
easy to detect by XRF, but the sodium could also be detected. Now, depending on the dose level, uh, this, you know, it, it's, it's something that you can evaluate. This is a very low dose uh, and very low drug loading compound, uh, but XRF can, can actually see it quite well and it can see it directly. So the idea is that if you were to choose, we have a couple of different X-ray lines that we could use um, for this purpose. Uh, the L-alpha line travels through, or we get what we call an analysis step. Um, so we're exciting that, that material, and but we can see the L-alpha line to about 0.4 millimeters within the pill. So you can do the front and the back. Um, you can get an idea of local potency. Um, you could also go to the K-alpha line, which is a shorter wavelength, more energetic, and with this, we can actually see up to 50 some millimeters, 55 millimeters of uh, a depth through the sample and still get signal. So you know, potentially you could even stack multiple pills. So depending on these, we have a lot of different options. And that's the case well, you know, with a lot of the different elements and lines. And we can kind of pick and choose how we would use that to use it for different benefits. So here's an example of um, using the uh, ion L alpha line and creating the calibration curve. And you can see this really good correlation here. So if you're interested in seeing how we did this, uh, please come to our workshop at 2.30 where we can create a calibration curve, which is very straightforward uh, and simple to use. And once you create it, you don't have to recalibrate. Um, we just maintain the, the method and then just um, analyze the unknown um, afterwards. Again, and then you can also do check samples or drift the method to maintain it. But the key here is you don't have to redo the calibration every day. And, and the other thing too is that um, the uh, standard levels, you know, we're at, at 700 ppm. So we're at very low levels, but we can, you know, still get a lot of signal. And you can see that in the spectrum that's on showing. Um, if we were to do the K line, uh, we could add or we could do larger amounts of sample and we can get um, even more signal using that K line. It just depends on what purpose. So if you're interested in learning more about that, contact Ton and I and, and we'll, we can work out uh, you know, some time to talk to you directly. And then once you created the method, um, our software has this easy um, analysis interface where you would just click the position of where you put the sample in, select the method, and hit start. It's as simple as that. And you can have the method, the um, results transferred to a folder via limbs or just have it directly go to any folder that you specify as well. So that it really is a walk-up system um, that would just dump the data and you don't have to go back and, and re look at the data from here. The idea with that too is you would just put pills directly um, onto the system, depending on if we were just doing you know, one of those little pills at a time, we can even create a jig for the, the sample holder. So you just put individual pills in and analyze those um, even on the front and then on the back, um, you could do. So this is an example here, we're showing the, the difference between, uh, we had you know, multiple lots of, uh, of this this uh, material um, of those pills um, and looking at say three pills of each of the, the th or four different lots, you can see the difference in the dose um, weight. So the first two lots are, are fairly consistent, but then if you look at lot three and four, lot three is, is low on potency um, and lot four uh, is high on potency. In fact, lot four would uh, fail um, the actual potency. Now, that may be just on three pills. If we were to look at overall the lots, um, we may, may see that they're all, you know, within spec, uh, but these individual pills is what we're looking at, and we see, you know, some variations. So now we're looking at, we took, we isolated certain pills that were really low or ones that were really high, and you can see repeat analysis on, on one pill. We're getting something that's in the 80, you know, dose weight. Uh, now, if I were to couple that, with the second pill, I might get something, you know, on average that's within the do right, right dose range. Um, but individually, what I might take one day is not enough, um, you know, to get a therapeutic effect. And another day I take a, a, another dose um, and I'm getting something that's too much. So, uh, you know, it's, it just shows a, a benefit of using this type of technology. Um, I haven't destroyed that material. So if somebody wanted to go back and verify the method, they could rerun on the system or they could take that then and run by another um, technique. 
uh, because that material hasn't been uh, altered or destroyed. And that's why we stress the importance of quality control um, from pill to pill or batch to batch. And this can be easily achieved through uh, building this type of method. So uh, switching gears now to another kind of use uh, for the same machine. Um, this was done on our Primus 4, uh, but even on our benchtop system, one of them has uh, the ability to do small spot sizes. So depending on, you know, to what extent or what kind of lab space, whatever somebody might have, it's a real, you know, benefit to have this type of technology um, in a lab that you can at least get to or have within your own, you know, your own facility. Um, this one can do micro mapping. So you might have an SEM, you might be able to do this, but typically that re requires a little bit more in terms of setting your sample up, putting in, finding whatever um, spec or region of interest you have. Uh, within this system we have here, we can just put it on the holder. There's a CCD camera. So you just get a, a live you know, image of the material. Just like here, we we're showing an example of putting in a penny. Um, we can zoom in on that. We see that from a, a, a screen from the software where we're zoomed in. And then you could actually, you know, do what like Ton was saying before with microanalysis. So just do a little pinpoint spot, um, and then you know do it on the, the, the kind of shiny surface and the uh, and then the copper surface there, and see what the difference is. And then that 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 we show a benefit in terms of a pharmaceutical material. If you have a pill that has a little speck in it or something, you're not sure is this come from manufacturing equipment? It was come from the reactor when the API was being made. Um, you can just load that up on the machine and you can do an analysis at that spot and at a spot next to it, or you could map it as what we're showing on the next slide here, where we're looking at that whole area within the red uh, rectangle. Um, we could look at it for iron, we look at it for zinc, look at it for calcium, see a depression of whatever's there for calcium, because that's actually a calcium salt, that material. And we could look at it for carbon even and see you know, also that it's, it's depressed in terms of where that spot is there. So that tells us it's you know, a, some type of a metal bit in there that contains iron and zinc. And, and besides, I'm not just using it just for pills for contamination here. Um, I've actually trained a company where they make paper and they actually had a contaminant similar to this on paper. It was just a black speck and we were able to do um, micro mapping or micro analysis on it and determine what that speck was made out of. And from there, they were able to diagnose for what production line caused that contamination that went cleaned out that part. So it is very useful to determine, diagnose uh, where these contaminants are coming from. And like I said, a lot easier than an SEM. Doesn't have the resolution of an SEM, but in general, most of your things, it's some visible contamination right. that you're looking right. for. And it's just another way of looking at the data. You can do it in a 3D way. So if you want to make your presentations pretty like this, <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> but you do find out your problem very quickly. In addition, because we have this feature, you could also load up a lot of small little samples. So if you had power samples, you wanted to load them up and just have the machine go and analyze each one. You could prepare something like what's shown on here, load it up, and we can create mapping tables. So instead of having to look at it with the CT, CCD camera and do that, these all these positions can be pre-loaded, and, and then you just put a sample in it and do 30 analyses really quickly. And by creating this mapping table, um, you can make it uh, do high throughput because it's already specified on the mapping table here. Once you put all these samples in, it'll go to the, each spot automatically. So you don't have to go and do the camera each time. Right. So just switching gears here, we're gonna show um, different examples of um, using all these medication to show the blend uniformity, um, when you're doing formulations, what you can look uh, look for. So what I did here was I took each of, um, well, these all these pills here, ground them up and pressed two grams of it into a, a pellet with this aluminum ring and then just loaded it onto um, our sample holder. Okay, and then we're just gonna show um, the differences in what the formulations are with these types of medication. So here, what I showed here was um, the differences between the aspirin 81, which is a low dose, and a coated aspirin dicalcium phosphate. If so if you overlay the, the heavy scan, which is what we're showing here in this top spectrum um, from titanium all the way up, you can see that the aspirin 81 is coated with the titanium dioxide here, which is um, colored in red. And then similarly down here, um, for phosphorus especially, 
the blue, which is your um, dicalcium phosphate, has a huge peak here. So you can see right away the differences between these two aspirins. Um, and, and then similarly with the magnesium. And these can all be quantified quite well. So you can make quantitative methods. You can also, even just through the semi-quant, see are you getting the, the right um, blending in if you were to take two different lots and you see a variation in one of those excipients. Maybe the mixing is not good for one of those. Um, so there's a lot of benefit here. Uh, and there's, you know, many of the excipients uh, have these atoms that the machine can, can easily identify. And if there are some contaminants, you'll be able to see it right away through all these spectra. That'll pick it up because it's scanned all the way from fluorine to um, uranium. So just showing some more examples um, and, and semi-quant results looking at the uh, various, you know, formulations. So these are all the ones we looked at here, the two aspirins. We have naproxen sodium, lansoprazole, which it's actually lansoprazole has fluorine in the structure, so we could look at that. Um, and then I don't know what that last one is there. I can't see it. It's it's a yeah, so um, we're looking at all of those and you can see, and you can clearly see in there where, like, so in the case of calcium there, you see a huge uh, peak for the atorvastatin. Um, you see some for that, that aspirin as well, because of course it's calcium uh, phosphate. And, it's, and with that one as well, you see a huge phosphorus peak that's kind of off the charts here. Um, so we were focusing here on how low it can detect on all the others. Obviously, the, um, the I think it's the aspirin dicalcium phosphate is so big for, for the phosphorus here, but all these other ones here are so low. We're zoomed in on that just to show you the capabilities of how low you can go down to. So the idea here is, that, you know, it's just more uses that you could have depending on when you're when you're looking at these things. And sometimes, you know, the LC doesn't necessarily see many of these excipients, uh, especially the, you know, mind excipients or clays or things like that. Um, and you can easily use an XRF to do a direct analysis on it. Oh, and speaking of that, we know like some cement companies are using um, aspirin as their binder. Yeah. So they, you know. In a they, cement, in a cement. Right. Yeah. So they might want to make sure that if they're going to stick with uh, using one aspirin, make sure they don't, you know, use a different one because it's obviously completely different because there's a lot of calcium in this one yeah. versus using this. And then these are just the results, um, the semi-quant results from, from these uh, three examples right here, showing um, that uh, the differences in what is detected and, and also from here for the aspirin coated one, the dicalcium phosphate, you can reprocess it different ways as calcium or if you put this in our compound table and um, put in the formula dicalcium phosphate, you'll be able to reprocess it showing the results um, for that as compared to just calcium. Yeah, so if you don't want to look at it as and then calculate, well, how much of that particular, uh, you know, material or excipients in, uh, and, and weren't just looking at in terms of the total metal concentration, you could uh, reprocess the data by putting in different compounds. And like in the, the last one there, what Tun's showing is, so naproxen sodium, you see obviously there's a lot of sodium in there because it's a sodium salt. Um, it's a fairly high drug loading, um, but then it also has titanium dioxide. So instead of just analyzing it as titanium, we want to see well, how much titanium dioxide. Of course, that's all on, on the outer coating. Um, but that's uh, just different ways you can use this tool uh, to get fast results. Um, that really is beneficial. I mean, it's, it's just an extra thing you have in your, your lab, another tool uh, that isn't there right now. All right, so we hope you enjoyed um, this session and found it informative. And if you have more questions, please join us at 2.30 okay, for our uh, workshop where we can uh, show you how to create calibrations, uh, how easy it is to run routine sample analysis. And if you have questions at that point, we can answer them as well. Right, right. and if you want to email us as well, there's our emails. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, feel free to contact either one of us and um, we'd be happy to you know, talk to you or your group, um, give a presentation on how, how XRF might benefit you and help steer you as well if you're interested in it and what would be the right you know, machine, what would be the right set of capabilities um, that you might want to input in your lab. And uh, you know, it's something I feel really strongly about because I worked in the industry, uh, wish now that I've seen what these tools can do, which we had always had that as a capability uh, where I worked. All right, All right. see you soon. Bye.